dear to me, I, I just left it behind. I had to start entirely new. Everything had to be new. Is there anything in your life worth that kind of sacrifice? In 1993, Matthew Collins had to flee the UK in a hurry. For three and a half years, he risked his life on a daily basis, secretly passing information to a journalist about some of the most dangerous people in the country. Nine years later, he's risked everything again by coming back to answer a simple question. Was it worth it? So Matthew, we've flown you in here to, you've been away for a long time, you're living in exile, you've come in secret, this is the first time you've given a face-to-face -face television interview about what you've done and you're doing it at considerable risk to yourself. Just what did you do to put yourself into such a dangerous situation? I passed information to Searchlight, the anti-fascist magazine, and gave an interview to a World and Action documentary about the activities of the far right, the National Front, the BNP. C18 to the UDA. What sort of information were you passing on? Anything from violence, uh, racist attacks, Jewish graves being desecrated, right up to passing uh, funds and arms to the UDA. What kind of people did you mix with? Psychopaths, football hooligans, thieves, drunks, perverts, Jew haters, black haters, people uh, eventually uh, went on to become involved in murder, the supply of firearms, terrorists. And what did your information achieve? It helped um, bring down a group like Combat 18 and expose them on television for their violence. And did it lead to convictions? It did lead to convictions, yeah. So were you a mole? Yeah, I was a mole. For eight months, I worked right under the chairman of the National Front. I was employed full-time by them in their head office. So I was you know, privy to everything inside the organisation. So how were you in a position to inflict such damage on the far right? I was someone who switched sides. I didn't join as a mom, I joined as a, as a member, as a believer. But you can sit here now and, and say this to me, so, so were you like that? I wasn't a terrorist. <laughs> no, <laughs> the others, but you, but yeah. you painted a pretty grim picture in well, that. That's what, it, that's what it's like in there. So you weren't questioning it? No, at first it was, most, it was very exciting. These were, and they were, they were good people and they were very good to me. I belong to, to this club, I felt you know, very part of you know, the inclusion of it, I felt very much part of it. So you were genuinely joined up because you thought this was the right thing to do? 100%, I thought I was actually morally right. Were you ever violent yourself? Um, yeah, well, of course, of course I was. Um, I'm not immune to it, and I wasn't immune to it before I joined. I went, you know, I grew up in, in South London, so of course you're never immune to it. You grow up and it's part of it. And um, at, at times it was necessary uh, for my own protection or for the protection of others. But generally, that is part and parcel of, of the politics. Did you enjoy the violence? Yeah. Was there a thrill in it? Oh, it was, yeah, it was thrilling. The, adre the adrenaline was, was huge and it, it, it's all infectious. People would know who you are and what you were involved in, they turn away and they... So it think. gave you a kind of feeling of power? Absolutely. Untouchable. I was absolutely untouchable. It was, it was, I wasn't very good at it, that was the only problem for me. How do you uh, mean you weren't very well, good at I, it? I, I did get beaten up quite, quite regularly. A lot of bruises and black eyes and uh, broken teeth and these kind of things just went untreated. And you would do the same to other people? Oh, given half a chance, but like I said, I wasn't very good at it, unfortunately. Well, fortunately. When did you first get involved? How old were you? Fifteen. Um, and how did you first get involved? What was the first thing that happened? A friend of mine rang me excitedly. He just had some newspapers put through his door. And they had this, uh, all this information about the movement and an obituary to Rudolf Hess inside it, who was the Nazi leader who just died. And it excited you when you saw it? Yeah, it was very different. It was very, very dangerous. And I really wanted to get involved in this and see what it was about. And I got in touch with them and went along to a, a socialism they had in the pub. I knew 
something wasn't right with this country. They seemed to have quite alternative answers to the ones I was used to. And so what did they tell you at that first meeting? I knew that they would hate blacks, and I knew that they didn't like Asian shopkeepers, and I knew that they felt that Britain was going down the pan and it should be fantastic. What I didn't expect was in the first five or ten minutes to be told that the Holocaust was a hoax, mm -hmm. and that the Jews are poisoned in the water, and all these incredible conspiracy theories really knocked me, you know, knocked me back a little bit. I wasn't expecting that. Even so, I mean, you got on incredibly well. In fact, you rose up the ranks very, very quickly. Yeah, well, I did, I did very well because I didn't have any tattoos, so I was in the intellectual section. And I was quite presentable and reasonably articulate in comparison to some of my, my colleagues in the, in the movement. The older members of the organisation, they, they really wanted me to, to get up there and get, you know, get involved and try and take a leadership role in, in the organisation. In many respects, you came from a typical South London family, but there was a difference in your case. Tell me about your father. He left home yeah. when you were quite young, didn't he? Left he left home, I think, when I was four. My parents separated and then divorced when I was four or five. And he went off with someone? He went off with my babysitter. Who was? She was black. It's not an obvious step for someone with effectively a black stepmother yeah. to join an organisation who... Hated babysitters. Did you like the black babysitter? Well, she was my babysitter, not his. He should have found his own babysitter, not mine. <laughs> so you were kind of angry with him for nicking your babysitter? No, I was angry with him for running away, and I was angry with her for running away with him. The colour didn't come into it, to be honest. Did he like you? Was he proud of you? No, I don't think so. I, 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 when I joined the National Front, I asked him for the, the £10 membership fee, and his response was quite... Um, what did he say? He said that I, he said that he was a, by their standards, he was an ignorant. Because he was married to one. No, he didn't marry her. Because he was Irish. Because he was Irish. And he said the Irish are the niggers of Europe. And he said he really didn't. You know that he came to England and it was no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. And he said he didn't. Even though you know he really didn't think that was a good idea for me to do that. So he hated that. He hated that. He thought it was childish. It was stupid. Where I really made a stand. Um, in Jordan National Front. He rejected that, and I've, I'd felt he'd rejected me in that. And what about your mum through all this? So she was left with four boys... Not really not. So you're a child who's, who's growing up, and you, you have a father who's pretty absent, you've got a mum who's struggling to bring up four kids, yep. and I assume there isn't a lot of time for parental one-to-one -one love and affection in that we, circumstance. We, no, we got plenty of it. I think I just sort of spiralled out of control and she just wasn't aware what, what was going on at, at the time because you know like all boys I was hiding magazines under the bed I just didn't think she knew they were Nazi ones I think she thought they were the usual ones <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I never could ever complain about any of, of, of the things I was given at home all the love, all the comfort, the warmth and, you know and the humour too yet there has to have been some kind of emotional gap in your life because when you became involved in the National yeah. Front I mean you have said in the past there, that yeah. it was the sense that you know you you had father figures in there and yeah I, I, well you know the the leading male role the guys in the NF they encouraged me you know to be like them and that was good and follow their lead as well and in the end these were the people that you betrayed weren't they yeah I betrayed them what turns a loyal disciple into a Judas for Matthew Collins that turning point came in 1989 soon after the British National Party opened its UK headquarters in Welland, South London. During an attack at the local library, Matthew glimpsed what he saw as the dark heart of the far right. So what did his friends do to turn him against them? What happened at Welland Library was, was the catalyst. It really started me thinking about the whole movement. It was a, a meeting held by concerned residents about having the head office of the BNP move into Welling. And in we burst, you know, uh, up to 40 of us, grown men, uh, kicking the doors and, uh, and not, not to just have an argument or a discussion or a debate or even to protest, 
just to smash this meat and smash the reds. Why did you pick on this group in Welling Library? They sound incredibly innocuous. Because the feeling was that it was art. This is now our area. And the whole feeling was that this was an absolute outrage. That Greenwich community against racist attacks had come to Welling to hold this meeting and it was just not on. And it was a show of strength. So people in Welling knew that the BMP were there and they were tough. Who were the 40 people who burst in, apart from you? It was led by uh, two of the senior members of, of the BMP and a removal van from Essex just full of really violent young men, football hooligans, uh, and myself and some other chaps from the National Front. Did you yourself kick anybody, hurt anybody? When, we, when I got Did you hit, actually hit someone? Yeah, I did hit someone. In the face? In the face. Wasn't a very good one because the chap behind me had to finish the job for me. What do you call finishing the job? Well, it made sure that the chap didn't get up. We're kicking him on the floor? Well, I went straight into the meter and behind me, of course, 40 men trying to get over two bodies. You know, they, they stamped all over him. When I get into the meeting, it's just women. Just a lot of old women and a lot of young women. And there's no real organisation and no huge security in there. And they're all just sitting having a meeting and <clears throat> all hell broke loose. But you haven't been a stranger to violence. I mean, you've talked about it already, that you quite liked it. Uh, Why was this different? Was I didn't say I liked it. I said I, was, I, was, I wasn't immune to it. It just, it just seemed totally out of proportion and, and over the top. There were other things we, that they could have been doing. It was, Did any of the women get hurt? Oh, I think somebody jumped through the window to escape it. I mean, I think nine people went to hospital. There was no stopping them. Once they got in there, you know, uh, one of them who went on to become an, an elected official for the BMP, had a motorcycle helmet in one hand and a hammer in the other. And the, the people in the meeting were, you know, sort of cowering away into this corner and they just kept coming and coming and coming with chairs. And when people were on the floor, they picked them up off the floor and hit them again. By then I'd been involved in the organisation for, for two years and I'd seen lots of fights and I'd seen victories and defeats, but I'd never seen anything uh, as terrifying and as pointless as this. Did you feel ashamed? Not until after. At the time I was just terrified and, and so I left. And I got onto the street and I felt physically sick. I couldn't believe how bad it was. I, I, you know, I thought this was going to be on the news. I couldn't believe anybody wasn't killed. Two or three days later when the local press came out and I went to the BNP head office, it was on, on the wall this big press cut and, and a lot of grown men sitting around drinking tea. The first thing they asked me was to contribute to a, uh, a fund that they'd set up for the three or four guys who actually had been arrested for the attack. Would I like to contribute two or three pounds? And I thought, this is, this is unbelievable. And it set me thinking, you know, this is the same people that tell me that the Holocaust didn't happen. And then they'd also tell me what a wonderful thing it is that 40 grown men will go and attack a, a meeting of women and they really did attack it. It blew me away. So what happened next? I mean, clearly you're starting to have big second thoughts. I, well, I, for a while I said, I'm going to give the BNP a wide berth. And I thought, I'll throw myself into the NF and try and find the clear distinction between this. But it, it haunted me. It haunted me because the only people we would ever recruit now would be the same people that found this acceptable. People who were, had grown up in the same sort of areas and conditions that I have, you know, South London, no, no ideas what they're going to do. Very violent. Give me a sense of what the country was like then. We've got Mrs. Thatcher in power. Mrs. What's it like inside oh, of London? We had Mrs. Thatcher, we had Keith Blakelock who'd been murdered on the Broadwater farm, he had been hacked to death. Football hooligans, no one was going to football, there was no Premier League. You know. And high unemployment? High unemployment. You know, who knew where they was going to work or if they was ever going to get a job? Youth training schemes, things like this. I didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel for people living on council estates, for instance. Couldn't see it. Couldn't see it for me. Did you feel you had no hope no. as a kid like you? Yeah. Well, what, what was I going to do? I had absolutely no skill. I had absolutely nothing going for me. This is fantastic for the BNP because where these questions are unanswered and people don't have these answers, the BNP are, are question and answer at the same time. They're putting these leaflets through the doors that they're raising your profile, they're giving a little bit of confidence to the community and at the same time 
making you feel that you're under, you're under siege from, from your neighbours of, of a different colour. Matthew grew increasingly disillusioned with the racism and violence that surrounded him. Over the five years that followed the Wellin Library attack, racially motivated crime in the area rose dramatically and there were four racist murders, including that of Stephen Lawrence. But even before those killings, Matthew had decided that it wasn't enough just to give the far right a wide berth. He wanted to bring them down, but how? I'd never made this conscious decision that I was going to be an informer. I just thought some things had to be righted, you know, something had to be redressed. And then of course I phoned Searchlight magazine. Searchlight's an anti-fascist magazine, uh, who you know, is the bane of the fascist life. It campaigns against racism and fascism, and it works within the community with community organisations and the government to try and combat the dangers of racism and fascism. Why did you go to Searchlight and not to the police? I'm not a grass. I, you know, and I had, the, I had the choice. And as we've seen from people with inside the movement who end up going to the police, that often that's not a way to actually stop the activities that I needed to feel as a better person that I was actually helping it will combat fascism. But it was still pretty risky for you to oh, well, if make I, these calls to search like were you aware how risky it was? Without a doubt. I mean it was the in a lot of ways it was the most stupid thing I ever did because had I been caught, I mean I I phoned them sometimes from the National Front Head Office and just sort of gave them inf anonymous information, tip offs. You used the phone in the office? Well, I, I couldn't get out to use the phone box all the time. And of course, in those days, you couldn't do the redial and find out where the call came from. I knew it was dangerous. What I, would have happened if they'd found out, if someone had walked in on one of your phone calls? Well, you and I wouldn't be um, sitting here today. Do you think you'd have been killed? I would have been disgraced and I would have been very badly beaten. Without, you know, thankfully, no one's ever been caught, but suspicion alone has led to people, you know, broken legs or broken arms, badly beaten, beaten unconscious. And of course then there's the whole thing that they'll just set fire to your house or they break all your windows and harass your family. And I felt silly for putting my family through that at the time because they were so apolitical. But it, this was a mess I created. Mm -hmm. And this was a mess I had to deal with. But you were still, still in your day to day, you were still involved. Why didn't you just quit at this point? I couldn't do that. Why not? This was my life. I'd, I'd, I'd foregone everything, uh, a half-decent social life, a promotion at work or, you know, meeting new friends, going places, flying to Ibiza, you know, normal things that guys I'd gone to school with who didn't get involved were doing. This was my life. These were now the, the only friends I had, and this was terrifying. The only friends I've got are psychopaths. So did you think of yourself as a hero? No, a I, no. I, a traitor, suppose. well, traitor because, like I said, they were friends. They were my friends. But always not a hero, just someone who'd done something really stupid. Just righted some wrongs, hoping to make something better. And you were still incredibly young, weren't you? How old were you? 18 or 19, I think. So you embark on this life as a secret agent, yep. but after a time, the anonymity has to get lifted. What happened? Well, the information was obviously good. So I searchlight could tell it was coming from, you know, within, you know, the heart of, of the movement, the far right. And they just said, we need to meet. We need to get this on a proper foot and to make sure that you're, you know, you're safe. Where and when did you first make contact with Searchlight's editor, Jerry Gable? We, uh, we, used, to, we used to meet in the uh, various museums around, around central London. And they gave me the, the, the pseudonym uh, Brian, so when I could ring the office or you know, if there was a message in the magazine for Brian, I knew it would be me. Why were you in such public places? For both of our security, but I would say generally, I wouldn't, you know, because listen, you know, he doesn't know that I'm not going to turn up and decide to kill him. He doesn't know it's not a, a set up on him. You know, I could be feeding him good information just to, you know, to, to uh, pull him in. And so you must have been pretty scared. I was terrified. I mean. It, we could have gone walking down, down the street and someone they, uh, could have been driving their taxi or their bus or their delivery van and seen us. And after that first meeting, how did your relationship develop? Well, the museum thing continued. You know, I went to see just about every museum that there was, uh, there was in London. And I started getting there early to have a look around. Because Jerry got in where else early as well. So often 
we'd often end up bumping into each other like an hour before the meeting. Uh, and go around the museums? Go around, go around the museum, you know, natural history, science, Victoria and Albert, we, yeah, we saw them all. Had tea and scones in just about every London museum. Were you paid for the information that you passed over? No, I, I, got, I wish I had. You know, I'd be a millionaire by now, but I got, um, I got book tokens. I actually wanted beer tokens, but Jerry said no. He um, would uh, pay for anything I, I did. If I had to go somewhere with them, I got reimbursed. But often he'd come along with this book and say, you should read this. What sort of information were you passing on at this point? Everything. I mean, from the day-to-day -day phone calls in, in the office, uh, who was attending branch meetings, who was leafleting, what our leaflets said, what the campaigns were going to be, who we were going to attack, mm -hmm. or by then it was who they were going to attack, who was on the attack, who was organising it. You know, the full picture, so that Searchlight felt it was actually there all the time and, and could try and understand and pick things out. And were you still actually employed by the National Front at this point? <clears throat> no, I, I stopped being employed by the National Front because I didn't really want to work there anymore, because also I was didn't want to be around them all the time, so I moved out of that position. But in the evenings you'd go to in the, the office? In, in the evenings I'd go to the office. I was still chairman of South London National Front. It was a very responsible job. Why did you keep going? Why didn't you get out at this point? Because the stories just kept getting bigger, bigger and bigger. And the, the BNP were getting more and more dangerous in East London with their Rights for Whites campaign. You know, huge gangs of, of white, white Nazis out every night breaking windows, smashing things or attacking people in their home. So I, I sort of put myself under the pressure to keep doing it while I felt it was useful. And I really hadn't, really hadn't ever thought about what I was going to do afterwards anyway. For three years, you'd managed to maintain a steady stream of information without blowing your cover. Then something happened, didn't it? Yeah, well, in late 1992, I was approached by uh, World in Action to uh, take part in a documentary they were doing about the activities of Combat 18 which was a far-right terror group that uh, began its life as the security wing of the British National Party. And I had a good deal of knowledge about the workings of it, and I had close relationships with uh, a number of the senior f figures in it. And, you know, I was told by such like, do this show, and then really decide what you want to do afterwards. So it felt very much to you like this would be the end? This was fine. Go this. Yeah, this was, this was my goodbye. I think, and also I think because of how dangerous C-18 was, along with their connections with loyalist terrorists, that this was, uh, this was important enough for me to make that decision then, that I will do this. You asked for anonymity. Yeah. How did they provide that for you? I was played by an actor called, called Simon with his face, uh, his face blacked out. And um, he read my words, my exact, exact words. All the leadership, the generals of C-18, are known UDA members. They're in close contact with the commander of the UDA. Charlie Sargent's known as a pig, and he's a bit of an animal. He loves violence, he's a, he's a knife merchant. He loves knives, he'd stab anybody. He'd stab me or anybody he worked with. If you cross Charlie Sargent or grasped, then Charlie Sargent would have you seen too. In C-18, he's the main organiser. He gives out orders, recruits people. He's the man. That's it. The programme went out in April 1993. My 21st birthday, yeah. It's just after that. Did you watch it? Yes. What did it feel like? Oh, it felt terrible. I, I, kind of terrible? Well, because I sat there and I said, everybody knows this is me. I know it's me. And so did some people who watched it. They said, that's Matthew. So what happened after the programme? Were there any arrests made? Well, because of the links that the programme made uh, between the far right and also the loyal ter loyalist terrorists, there were actually three arrests made on people attempting to supply arms to loyalist terrorists. There must have been an incredible witch hunt going on for Simon at this point. Yes, there was. Right. My phone was constantly ringing by people I was still in touch with, people that were loyal to me, saying that they're asking questions, they're holding meetings. Obviously people asked if it was me, uh, and I always gave the, the standard answer. No, it's not me. You know, we're all harmed by this. You know, I, I'm a senior member in the movement. I really think we've let ourselves down. Did you find it easy to lie? Under those circumstances, I had absolutely no difficulty whatsoever. Eventually, I, I was actually contacted by a special branch who were supposedly in charge of monitoring uh, the activities of the far right. And, and they came to see me and they were very serious that if I was this character, Simon, which they, they 
they'd picked up from within the far right that some people were saying I was the character. And they said, we know for a fact you're going to get shot. Because a lot of people have been very embarrassed by this program. So why didn't they just come and shoot you? Who was the tech? I, I had a very good friend uh, called Eddie Wicker, who... And Eddie Wicker... Eddie Wicker was, was um, one of the top stewards on the far right in the National Front and Combat 18. And he was on remand in Winston Green Prison in Birmingham. After the program, he was arrested. And he refused. You know, he told them from inside there that he would not allow any action against me. Because he and I had a very close friendship. You know, we both trusted each other an awful lot. And he was absolutely certain that it wasn't me. And if it was me, that I deserved some kind of trial, some kind of kangaroo court, I suppose. And he told them from inside prison, no one touches Matthew Collins. And of course, eventually, he, get, he gets released. And then the police came to me and said, you've got to go. So it happened quite quickly when you finally got to that? Uh, yeah, quite quickly. I think Eddie got out on a Friday and I got on the plane the Friday after. No time for goodbyes. Were you given any help to relocate to another country I had, by I had special branch? I had my plane ticket and special branch. He took me to the embassy and got me the visa. Straight away, straight to the front of the queue and got the visa to leave. So when you got off the plane in the new country that you've chosen, yeah. what did you feel like? What did you feel you'd left behind? Everything. I, I was 21. I'd left behind my family, my job, uh, my girlfriend. Uh, everything that was dear to me, I, I, I just left it behind. I had to start entirely new. Everything had to be new. Was it frightening? Terrifying. In, in everything. Not just what I'd left behind, but actually what I had to do now. All on my own. What do you miss about England most? The weather. I miss the football. I miss, I miss, I miss English pubs. I miss um, the newspapers. I miss the television. I miss all of those things that some people will take for granted. What do you do to try to get well, back? Well, yeah, I, I do the usual. I go and sit in a pub in a country that doesn't even like football. And I, I badger and persuade these people to put football on the television. And they don't necessarily like it when I do it. And I sit there and I watch the football. And I'm the loneliest man in the pub. Sometimes I feel like I'm the loneliest man in the world. You've paid a hell of a price, you know. Not many people would have to <laughs> I have you know, give up their homeland yeah. and become an exile. But you've been gone now for nine years. I mean, does it not depress you that you come back and you see that the BNP is has got much bigger, in fact, in your absence, and has got a much bigger toehold in British political life. Do you feel that well, uh, what you did was worthwhile? Oh, absolutely worthwhile. I don't regret it. But I, you know, I often ask myself that, or get asked it as well. But I, I, I never know. It just seemed all the way along the line I was doing the right thing. Something that I had to do. If you hadn't turned against the far right, where do you think you'd be now? <clears throat> I'd be chairman of the National Front, probably. It's the one job I've missed out on that I'll uh, never worry about. But possibly, yeah. I mean, the guy who's leading it now isn't very good, so I could have got the job. And next time 